Um, we'll get started. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm expecting to see a few more people turn up. But no, that the, that the brighter moon is brighter them off. A um, uh, couple of things. Uh, we've got the the uh, society barbecue this Saturday, um, which I haven't checked with the guy that normally does it. Uh, I'm assuming that that will be on. Gin boys. Sorry? Can't hear you. Do you want me to get my microphone out? Yes. Yeah. Um, the uh, barbecue is on this Saturday. Uh, the From an astronomical point of view, I guess it's astronomical. Um, we have an Aurora alert out at present, uh, and it's actually been out for a couple of days. But, but when you look at the actual sunspot that set off the uh, the coronal mass ejection, it's about this big. So I'm, I think it's a bit of wishful thinking. Um, and, uh, but the television people have latched onto it and they're pushing it like that. So it could be, could be like a meteorite. Uh, they want to break from the political scene. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that type of meteorite. So. Um, we've got uh, a guest speaker tonight, um, and uh, uh, Jeremy Malt is well known to us. He's spoken to us a couple of times, or several, more than a couple of times. Um, and uh, Jeremy's going to give us a talk on um, dark matter and the cosmological sort of implications of that. Um, his last talk to us was also on dark matter, but things have changed a bit since then, so we'll get an update on, on where things are sitting. And uh, I actually did something very unusual for me. I actually looked it up on the internet. So I hope the, uh, I hope the dark matter data on the internet is, uh, is uh, uh, true. Most things on the internet are. Um, so and the, the, raffle, the raffle box is going around, I hope. Yes. Thank you. Uh, prizes tonight, I grabbed my wife, put out a whole bunch of prizes, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you the until I went to the car. Um, we've got one of those gas stoves that are coming back into fashion. I don't know if there's any gas bottles in them. Dairy. 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 Yes. But, sorry? Dairy. Yes. Yes. No gas. Well, it's not a particularly good gas stove. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've also got a, um, uh, a uh, Wi-Fi speaker system, and uh, I've got one of those at home that works very well. Uh, for the technically minded, I've got a, a little multi-tool, it's just a small one, I reckon that's quite a handy little device. Uh, for Ian Solomon, the mandatory book on, on astronomy, in this case on space. What's it called? Chasing space. I'm not sure that the guy that's actually moved it. Um, it says he's trained as an astronaut. I'm not sure if he actually went up. And uh, that's about it. Oh, and a yellow. The mandatory yellow beanie. I've got heaps of these. So I must be getting down to the last of the beanies. Um, so we'll move on to the guest speaker and uh, introduce Jeremy. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, again. Uh, the you know, topic of dark matter uh, is one that's probably not all that um, uh, familiar uh, to you. Uh, but what you're looking at in um, the title slide here uh, is a uh, picture of stool taken from Big Hill uh, and the Grampians in the background. That may be uh, familiar. So what about dark matter? Uh, well. Uh, in the course of the last um, couple of decades, 
we have managed to inventory the total fraction of the universe that is dark matter, and we know this uh, very accurately. Um, uh, in that pie diagram there, uh, the familiar atoms of which we're uh, all made are only 4% of the energy density of the uh, universe uh, on average, uh, and dark matter uh, is uh, uh, six times as much, uh, and dark energy um, is three quarters of the universe. That's the stuff that causes the expansion uh, of the universe. Uh, but nobody knows, as this cartoon portrays pretty well, what the dark matter is. No one knows what's in the dark matter sandwich, and that's what uh, we want to talk about uh, um, this evening. Now, maybe this movie will work. It's always a chance, and maybe it won't. <laughs> okay, well, that's supposed to give you a 3D tour uh, around, but uh, it looks like it's one of those movies that only works in the lab. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, where did that come from? So when you look at, um, um, uh, uh, at the universe of galaxies, they're not uniformly uh, distributed uh, around the universe, uh, far from it. Uh, whether you actually um, sample the universe on a large scale by measuring uh, uh, redshifts to know how far away they are and construct your 3D model of the universe in that way, or whether you're a theorist uh, and you say, uh, I know the distribution of matter at the beginning of time was random, and so I'm just going to let those random uh, matter concentrations attract one another in the expanding universe. Whichever of those two things you do, observation or theory, you get this. Uh, and the scale there um, uh, is 125 megaparsecs across that bar. That's three times the number of millions of light years, so 375 uh, million light years from end to end of that bar. So that gives you the scale. Uh, and the color uh, uh, implies the density of matter or galaxies. And in fact, this is the theory version. So these are dark matter particles with no attached atoms at all. But believe me, the atoms attach themselves. So that any place there's a concentration of dark matter there, there's also a concentration uh, of uh, uh, luminous matter. And you can see the amazing thing is that uh, it forms this filamentary uh, structure like um, uh, a spider's web or whatever you whatever that conjures up for you. Uh, and, and so the galaxies are arranged in, uh, in filaments with, at the intersection of the filaments, these concentrations, which are clusters of galaxies. And uh, we know what they uh, look like. Um, so there's an Australian connection to uh, the realization that the universe is full of uh, dark matter. Uh, and it's um, the guy in the top right there, uh, Ken Freeman. Uh, what Matthew Flinders is doing there is uh, uh, Ken won the Matthew Flinders Medal of the Academy of Science uh, uh, six years ago. Uh, but then he got the uh, uh, Prime Minister's Prize for the same thing a few years later. Uh, so I, I haven't updated the slide, but uh, this is a very distinguished astronomer in Canberra. Uh, I guess uh, just retired now, who was uh, equal first, I'd say, to um, identifying the necessity for dark matter in galaxies. You've probably heard the story that uh, we know there must be dark matter holding galaxies together because the mass that we can see is not sufficient to get the stars to rotate fast enough at the speeds that we actually measure. So that is a, a, the gravitational signature 
of Missing Matter and Ken and Vera Rubin uh, were the first to um, uh, to realise that, but that was back in 1970. Dark Matter actually traces further back than that, but uh, uh, people only started to believe it when uh, the rotation curves of galaxies came out. And now with further work, nothing to do with the rotation curves of galaxies, but more to do with the microwave background radiation, uh, we know that it is exactly 24%. Um, no talk about dark matter is complete without showing you a picture of the bullet cluster. Uh, so most of what you see there, and there's a credit um, that I should uh, mention, most of what you see there is just Hubble Space Telescope pictures of, um, uh, of uh, galaxies, hence the nice resolution. Um, uh, but there's also been some colorization of the map there that allows you to see the dark matter. And you have to believe me that the dark matter is in blue. So what's the trick here? How can we see dark matter? Uh, well, it is a trick um, because the actual phenomenon here is that two clusters of galaxies, I mean, you can see the concentration of galaxies on the left of the colour and the right of the colour there. There's more galaxies there than there are on average. These are two clusters of galaxies which have attracted each, each other, uh, collided and actually gone through each other uh, because most of the space is empty so they just, the galaxies just for the most part go through each other uh, except that the gas in the galaxies doesn't behave in that way. The gas uh, uh, shocks and stays in the middle so the illuminated um, uh, uh, red part is actually glowing gas. Uh, and now for the tricky part, uh, how we know that where the dark matter is, is through a phenomenon called weak lensing. Um, and that is the bending of light by concentrations of matter. Uh, and so uh, when we uh, actually um, trace the light paths of the background galaxies to this uh, pair of clusters, uh, we're able to map the, that mass concentration uh, of uh, uh, dark matter. Uh, if you like, the map comes out of the computer as contours of dark matter, uh, just like contours uh, on a map, high points in dark matter, and then we add the color to go onto the contours. So it's a bit of a fake picture, but you are actually seeing the dark matter uh, in that picture, and you're seeing an important physical phenomenon, which is just like the galaxies, uh, the dark matter, uh, after the collision, just passed through um, the, um, uh, the collision center uh, and, uh, uh, and just as if it was stars, which it isn't, because it's not emitting any light, uh, it, um, uh, it is almost collisionless in properties. So that's an important property of dark matter. And the some of the physicists I know say, uh, I think about the bullet cluster every night. It's just so puzzling. How can the dark matter do this? We're still trying to figure out the properties of dark matter. However, there is hope to figure out what the dark matter is. A very good candidate for what the dark matter is, uh, is an undiscovered <coughs> physics particle, like a neutron, for example, except um, it only resembles the neutron in the fact that we are sure that dark matter is an uncharged particle, unlike a proton, uh, because um, uh, uh, if uh, it was charged, it would uh, uh, behave quite differently uh, in the universe. And if it was a neutron, uh, neutrons by themselves outside of nuclei only last for 91 seconds, so that's no good. We need particles of dark matter that persist for the age of the universe. Uh, so the neutron isn't a good candidate. So we make up stuff like, let's call the dark matter particle a neutralino, uh, which does actually have some physical properties, but uh, you can just consider that to be a name of an unknown uh, particle, if you like. And we can um, try to detect the dark matter particles uh, by their rare interactions with regular nuclei. Uh, 
and observe the recoil of the nuclei from such a collision. Now, why do we think the dark matter would collide with anything? The answer is that if dark matter is the stuff that holds the galaxy together, uh, it is either stationary or in random motion, and the uh, sun is traveling around the center of the galaxy uh, once every um, 100 million years with a velocity that we know to be 220 kilometers per second. So if we change the coordinate system and say we're at rest, we on the sun are at rest, and uh, things are moving relative to us, then the dark matter is passing through the laboratory at 220 kilometers per second. If that's the case, it will hit stuff occasionally. Uh, and our um, uh, <coughs> schematic here is of the dark matter particle coming in, uh, interacting with the nucleus, which gains some energy. The nucleus um, uh, will uh, go up a state um, in, um, uh, in energy and then um, decay down again, releasing a photon, and we go detect the photon. So that's the experimental setup. Uh, it's, act, it's easy to do a little bit of math and say that if the dark matter particle, we don't know the mass of the particle, this is the thing makes it, which makes it hard, if the mass of the particle is 100 billion electron volts, um, a proton mass is about 1 billion electron volts, so uh, this is um, 100 of those, uh, we can calculate its kinetic energy it's a half mv squared, it's not relativistic, it's just a half mv squared. So that's uh, what it is. And some of that energy is transferred to the nucleus and that's what we try to, to detect. Where do we do these experiments? At places like this, underground physics labs. Now we're getting close to the title of the talk, right? Uh, this is the one in Italy called the Gran Sasso uh, National uh, Lab. And uh, uh, that's an entrance to it. It's actually uh, off a road tunnel between Rome and Tirano on the uh, Adriatic. And the reason we put our experiments underground is to get away from the cosmic rays. We can't tell the difference between cosmic ray detections and dark matter detections. So let's get away from the cosmic rays. We go underground to where everything is quiet, so to speak. Uh, and um, some years ago, uh, an experiment, uh, one of the first experiments to attempt to measure nuclear recoil from dark matter uh, was placed in Grand Sasso. Its name was the Gamma Libra experiment. And it consists of a sodium iodide crystal, or actually a bunch of sodium iodide large crystals. You can grow huge crystals of sorry, sodium iodide, it's just like salt buy huge crystals or grow huge crystals of salt. Uh, you can't get them up to 250 kilograms in one crystal, but uh, you can get a few uh, kilogram uh, uh, crystals. And those are the nuclei that the dark matter particle is supposed to uh, interact with. And in the next slide, here is what they saw for the count rate in the uh, sodium iodide uh, as a function of time on the uh, uh, x-axis there. And what you can see there is starting off in the red, rather noisy up and down uh, count rate, but after they improved the experiment in, the, uh, in shielding and so on, you can see there's a very clear sinusoidal variation there, and you can even trace it back into the noisier data uh, with the um, uh, eye of faith and statistics. So after 13 cycles, this experiment had achieved a signal to noise of um, uh, nine, which definitely does not have happen by chance. You know, it's a, a, a very small probability that that would happen from uh, random chance perturbation of the uh, of the points there, uh, and um, the period is also indistinguishable from one year. So that we call annual modulation. And you can ask yourself, why would a dark matter signal be annually modulated? The answer is simple. Uh, 
our observatory is not stationed on the sun traveling at 220 kilometers per second. It's stationed on the earth, which rotates around the sun once a year at 30 kilometers per second. So the 30 modulates the 220 and hence you see <coughs> the uh, flux like the square of that modulation uh, uh, going up and down. So dark matter has been detected, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, the skeptics were very convinced by the data. Something is modulating with a period of a year, but um, how do we know it's dark matter? And the answer is we don't actually know it's dark matter. It could be something else. Given that the experiment's conducted against a strong background, if the background is modulating uh, annually, then we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that theory and the dark matter uh, uh, theory. So, what do we do about that? <coughs> uh, well, you can reduce the background some, and we're certainly going to do that in the future. But the secret to having uh, a, an underground physics lab in the Southern Hemisphere is that if the seasonal theory is correct, if perhaps there's snow cover on Grand Sasso that goes up and down and modulates the background due to absorption of muons or something, uh, then that's going to occur out of phase in the Southern Hemisphere. So we can either um, uh, confirm that um, it could be dark matter that's modulating the signal, or we can dispose of that if we find that uh, uh, it's going around um, with summer and winter rather than and the position of the Earth in, the, uh, uh, in its orbit around the Sun. So there's a few um, a little extra, well, I think I've probably covered most of those bullet points there. We like to call the dark matter a weakly interacting massive particle, because, and weakly because uh, the um, events that we're recording are very rare. Mostly the dark matter just passes through the target without interacting with a sodium nucleus or an iodine, um, iodine uh, nucleus. Uh, so weakly interacting and massive particles because um, uh, the favorite mass, and nobody knows what the mass is, is um, like hundreds of atomic mass units, not uh, not 100th, though, as I said, nobody knows what the mass is. It could be uh, any mass, and one of the purposes of the experiment is to find out what the mass of dark matter particle or particles is. Uh, I mentioned that the, the detector is um, sodium iodide crystals. Uh, and the bracket TL is a doping of thallium. Let's not go into that. The, we see the uh, excitation of the sodium iodide with a standard light detector, photomultiplier. Um, there are various ways of sealing this, uh, this arrangement, which you'll see in a moment. Um, and, uh, we have to keep the whole installation constant temperature and also in mines there tend to be contaminants like radon that we have to uh, uh, filter out. Uh, so as I said the um, experiment ran, Van Lever experiment ran for 13 uh, years uh, and, uh, uh, and the counter theory is seasonal variation. So here we are, um, uh, what I described, the Stahl Gold Mine, which is host to the uh, facility that we're building. It is a working gold mine. It got closed down a couple of years ago, but it's been opened up with a new investment of capital, and they are pulling in gold. They poured their first new bar since reopening uh, back in January and sent it off to the Perth Mint. It's not a public company, it's private equity that, um, that uh, is operating the mine there. Um, 
And the reason we can say it's opening in 2020, whereas for years we've been saying it's opening soon, <laughs> Uh, is that we got a grant of the University of Melbourne as the lead partner got a grant to you know, just this year. Uh, the Minister for Education uh, is um, on our, on my right there, as you my left, but uh, right of uh, right of me in that uh, uh, picture. <coughs> our lab director is the uh, uh, lady in the front there. Other people are the mayor, chancellor of the University of Melbourne, and the manager of the mine. Uh, and they're standing in front of a model of what we plan to uh, build one kilometre uh, deep below the surface in the mine. It's a decline mine, uh, which means that you can drive a truck into it, as you saw, and the truck goes down a helical path with a grade of 10%. So you travel 10 kilometres to get the one kilometre down. But that also makes it easy to bring your experiment down and do construction, and also to haul the gold out. Well, haul the ore out. <laughs> There's a mill um, which is also operating uh, in the mine. Uh, and we managed to get this grant not as an election promise, but, um, uh, but um, out of real money that uh, is being delivered to the University of Melbourne, independent of whether it was a change of government uh, or not next weekend. Um, yes, if you look at what um, research facilities have been put into regional Australia, uh, uh, and let's leave out the, um, uh, the um, uh, Great Barrier Reef research facilities and things like that, let's just talk about physical sciences research facilities. You have to go back all the way back to the Bicentennial Australia Telescope to find a facility that was put into regional Australia. So this, um, in some areas of government, is important. I think it's important too. Uh, and um, there's the quote from uh, from from the um, member for Wannan, which contains Dahl, owing to a redistribution that occurred just in time for the coming uh, election. Stall used to be um, <coughs> Mally. If you know your politics, Andrew Broad was the member for uh, Mali. We don't know who will be the new member for Mali, but anyway, the boundaries will reset, and now Stall is in uh, uh, is in Wannan, and Dan Tian, the current Minister for Education for a few more days yet, uh, and maybe longer, uh, is, the, um, is the member for Stall. So he was very pleased to see the mine reopen, and quite pleased to have this um, this research facility which is going to bring scientists into the uh, uh, region and not to a huge amount but at least on some level stimulate the economy a bit. This is what the um, mine looks like in, uh, in profile. Um, so you saw the picture from Big Hill uh, and you can sort of see the chemical road going down there. The um, the famous oil body is called the Golden Gift, reminiscent of the Stall Gift. Uh, and I have a version of the slide which actually pinpoints where the lab is going to be, but uh, it's sort of rare kind of thing. And, and, and actually, uh, where it says 1,000 there, or 1050 on the right hand side, it's at that level in meters um, <coughs> below the surface. All the points in the mine have some meter below the surface level and we refer to them in that way. Uh, so there's only one entrance, uh, one uh, uh, tunnel entrance to uh, the mine. There it is. You get in your truck and you go down. Uh, actually, you don't get in your truck. There's, and all Australian mines are highly regulated for safety and the record is good. But it's only good because there's quite a lot of discipline uh, uh, applied. So, uh, the agreement that Melbourne and the mine uh, signing makes the mine responsible for the safety of our uh, students and people who might get off the leash and, <laughs> and come to home. So uh, we have to be very careful that uh, uh, we follow the mine's very strict uh, regulations. No visitors can wander around. You have to be 
inducted, you have to be guided everywhere, no photographs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what it looks like down at the workshop level, um, as you can see, they're quite, um, you can take a, quite a tool truck uh, uh, down there uh, in uh, all the facilities we need, like ele electricity, ventilation, internet, they're all down there. Uh, mining technology has changed a lot to, um, uh, over the years, and it really uh, is a there's a point of view that really um, uh, it's a scientific organisation. There are a lot of geologists trying to figure out to, uh, what's there using uh, high level scientific diagnostics. It's really interesting from a physicist's point of view. Uh, we developed a collaboration with the Italians to do this so that we would have one experiment in Grand Sasso and one experiment to uh, quite similar to it, but actually independently built by us. We're not hosting their experiment. We are building our experiment in uh, collaboration with them. We hosted the um, uh, uh, our Italian collaborators at Great Western. I don't know if you know the Western Highway, but uh, past Ararat, you get to Great Western, which is a big sepulchre winery, quite a historic one with limestone cellars that you can tour. Uh, so we thought that would be a good place to uh, to uh, have our Italian uh, uh, guests. The director of Grand Sasso is standing right in the middle. There's the Fano and Ragazzi branch, but the, um, the Dark Energy Nobel Prize winner is, um, uh, is standing in the front row there. So this was a joint workshop between particle physicists and the astronomers. Uh, we did a lot of um, uh, testing of the mine for suitability. We wouldn't want to go into some place that was that had high background levels for whatever reason. So we went down and tested the background levels. That's Matteo Volpi of the University of Melbourne with an array of instruments down there. This is our um, underground physics lab director, Elizabeth Barbario. Uh, this is taking the Australian Research Council down the mine to figure out whether this was some kind of hoax that was being pulled on Canberra uh, uh, or actually a physics experiment. Uh, and the, um, uh, the uh, community relations person, David Coe, is doing the talking there uh, down at the lab the future lab level. Uh, he's talking to the Dean of Science, Karen Day at the University of Melbourne, and Katie Mack, who has now moved to North, to North Carolina, uh, is in the middle ground there. Uh, if you go there today, you will see the signs proclaiming what is being done, uh, in that the design work was done with a grant from Canberra back in 2015 uh, from the National Stronger uh, Regions Fund, so regional development. Our funding model is 50-50 state federal, so we're, we're um, uh, looking for to regional development Victoria to match the federal grant of five million that we have in order to build a full national facility. Uh, this is what it looks like, <coughs> the floor plan. Um, I think I've got a 3D model of it, but the floor plan has two entrances. One is where humans go to change their bunny suits because it's a clean room environment <coughs> in there for sort of obvious reasons. Uh, and the um, right hand entrance there is where you go if you're a truck, uh, you unload into that cleaning room there and the main experimental hall uh, is the rectangle with the cylindrical experiment vessel and is this organisation doing the mining and do you keep the gold? Oh, we tell the students that they can, <laughs> uh, they can uh, keep all the gold they can pick up. <laughs> but they'd better be quiet about it because the employees can't uh, remove gold either. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, there's the 3D model <coughs> actually printed by Ansto, which is one of our partners. But uh, um, I found it easier to, to uh, uh, that count rate. So there are various experiments that ANSO will be doing uh, 
uh, also involving uh, nuclear medicine, which is an ANSTO specialty. ANSTO makes all the nuclear isotopes that when you consume bar radioactive barium allows them to uh, tell whether your insides are working or not. Uh, as we develop better detectors for dark matter, there are spin-offs for um, uh, monitoring uh, radioactivity where it shouldn't be. So that's of interest. Uh, and um, Defense Science Technology Group, DST Group, which has got a lab in every city, um, is working with us uh, uh, on that. And then there's interesting, not astrophysics, but astrobiology that can be conducted underground as well, because Anyone who watches Brian Cox's movies will know that uh, uh, there are extreme forms of life that exist, not just at the bottom of the ocean, but in weird things such as uh, uh, such as volcanic vents in the deep ocean. Uh, we also have hopes of um, developing directional dark matter experiments, that's to say, not just counting the dark matter events that we see, but also saying where they came from. And if you think about it, a recoil is a vector event, that's to say the particles go somewhere. And so if you can trace the electron cloud that uh, accompanies the uh, nucleus that is recoiling, then you can get information on, uh, on the direction that the particle came from. So we're working on detectors that will be like that. We hope to map the halo of the galaxy in the future. What does that mean? Uh, well, the galaxy is sitting in uh, 100 kiloparsecs worth of very low density stars that um, uh, are the oldest stars in the galaxy. They formed first and they still sort of have these very um, uh, diffuse orbits that go out to great uh, distances from the galaxy. And the way this came about, we nowadays think, was that dwarf galaxies, with their dark matter, uh, were accreted by the galaxy over the lifetime of the galaxy. And so this is a sort of debris, if you like, of the formation of the galaxy. We don't expect it to be spatially homogeneous, as old theories used to say it would be. So um, once we can start to map the dark matter, uh, we can get information on how the galaxy forms. So it's a little bit futuristic, but we'll get there one day. Um, why do we want to make measurements at low background from the biophysics point of view? Well, uh, if you want information on what is happening at low levels of radioactivity, you can either extrapolate the data from the surface uh, or you can actually make measurements and scientists always prefer not to extrapolate so the underground labs provide that additional data point to add a low cost of rate level. Uh, this is just some technology on improved neutron detection. I don't think we should want to go through it. Uh, and a number of underground physics labs are doing astrobiology experiments. Um, uh, there's quite a bit of interest at the University of Melbourne now in developing a research direction <coughs> like this. Uh, and uh, uh, so some of these life forms get names like endolithic communities, which to me sounds like it means in rocks, inside rocks. What's the timeline for, <coughs> I should get this wound up so you can ask questions. What's the timeline for Supple, it's the underground physics lab. Uh, 